Well, contrary to popular belief, and I think this belief is shrinking throughout the decades, and especially the last 10, 20 years, but uh, having too many does on your land and having a lot of does isn't a good thing. There's always that balance. I talk about all the time, the more does you have, you get to a point of balance. As the number of does increases, so does the number of bucks to a certain point. That point might be right here, where the number of bucks you have rises with that number of does, not the same number, but meaning the potential of the most bucks you have. As the number of does increases, the number of bucks goes down. You know, we'll talk about some of these reasons right here and why you should always look at achieving balance or some easy ways to take to, to really achieve balance we'll talk about towards the end. I think traditionally, even people that recognize, wow, we have way too many does, it's hurting the herd, it's hurting our hunt, um, would look at it like we need to shoot every doe we see. And that's not a, a good way to approach it either. Uh, trigger control is one way, but it might not even be the best way. We'll talk about that in a little bit. And especially people that are really managing their habitat well. Uh, this is probably for you because there's a lot you can do to make sure that you don't have too many does, but you still have a good number of does. You want to have does on your property. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. You want to have quite a few does in October, November. But the timing of when those does are on your land is critical too. So why is that? Does take up space. And mature bucks, especially the older they get, they don't like to live in close proximity to those does and fawns. All goes back, I believe, to a year, year and a half old buck or a fawn. So either a yearling or a fawn. Fawns more in ag country because they're only a few months old. Mother kicks them out of the herd, but they don't need to be taught the way to a migration yard or deer yard and to survive that winter. But year and a half old in more northern areas or big wooded areas where you don't have that abundant ag field and foods and, and um, low uh, predator rates and uh, winter survival, then deer have to be taught how to make it through the winter. So mother will kick them out a year and a half old, that buck's first set of antlers. So imagine this doe is almost violently kicking the buck out of the herd and that young buck and then he on average disperses about a mile and a half so when he does that the last thing he wants to do is find a place that's dominated by female social pressure and let's face it a lot of properties have female social pressure because they have too many does very easy to get too many does you know again bucks don't want to live with them but it's easy to to have a lot of does on your property because if you get offer a lot of food you create good habitat then does will swarm to the property and you can track too many that mature bucks won't want to hang out there we'll talk about why but then at the same time, if you hunt it poorly, which a lot of hunters do, and we go to a lot, almost all the food plots we watch are being overhunted. Most people with food plots overhunt their food plots. They spook deer off, they create nocturnal plots, that creates a nocturnal property. But bottom line is, those does are really tolerant of hunting pressure, poorly set up properties, and so you can pile a lot of does into a property very easily just by offering great food and great cover, and uh, mature bucks are the hard part. They're, they're somewhere else. And so people say, wow, the ratio must be 10 does to every buck. No, the bucks are just somewhere else. And that somewhere else is what I want you for your property to have. Those doe-only properties, mature bucks come in at night, even if they come in for the rut here and there, there'll be less of them, fewer mature bucks, and they're only there for a couple weeks out of the year instead of three months or four months. So timing wise, the person who controls a herd is not the person that has all the does in the property. They're, they're often contributing to the downfall of the herd or to a poor herd structure in the area. It's a person that has that balance that I want you to be. They take up space, what's that mean? That means if you have a food plot here, you're gonna get does and fawns to bed in this layer of cover. If you have a food plot here, does and fawns are gonna bed up in this cover. If you have a food plot here, does and fawns are going to bed in there. All of a sudden you start looking, by the time you access around the land, there's nowhere left that a mature buck could live on the land and not be either intruded on your access or is, is forced to live with does and fawns, which is what he does not want to do. And what I see a lot of times, even in quality areas with big parcels, some will have a lot of food, they'll have a lot of cover, but the food is fragmented, it's all over the place, it's random. So you create a situation where a buck grows out of the property, meaning the older becomes, the more reclusive he wants to be. He can't tolerate a lot of herd stress, and so he goes and finds some place where it's a little bit quieter. Not that it doesn't have does, because if there's no does there, then how attractive is the parcel in either cover or habitat? Food. So if does don't want to be there, why would a buck be there? So he's going to find a place there's actually does, and but it's going to be a lot more balanced. He's going to have that depth of cover that I talk about where 
he can actually bed somewhere away from that food, two, 300 yards, 500 yards, have a little place that call, he can call home. He's not intruded on by you while you're hunting or by the does and fawns and young bucks that are on the property. And that's why you take a 40 acre parcel, you stick seven or eight does on that parcel, some fawns, you locate food accordingly. Now there might be 150 yards of cover in the back where a buck can actually bed and feel like he has his own space and he's not intruded on by those does or your hunter access. So that's kind of what I want, but you add 15 does and fawns, 20 does and fawns, 25 on that 40 acres because you have seven acres of great food plots and really good cover. Now you make a property that's so full of does you don't have a lot of bucks other than just the rut. Consume habitat is a big one too. Too many deer in general, they'll eat out of house and home. Part of that could be your food plots, but it could be the shrubs that you plant. It could be the browse that's in the woods. It could be the cover, thermal protection that the deer need during the late fall and winter time. So they consume resources because there's too many there. You create a vacuum a lot of times because you keep planting food, you keep planting habitat, you shoot a bunch of does and then more and more come. When you have to shoot a lot of does, it's disruptive every time you shoot a doe. So, uh, and there are properties that need to be built. You know, in, in the UP of Michigan, I was given the QDMA's Deer Manager of the Year Award in 04, and that was after I built the herd from 99 to 04. Because in that area, there were too few deer per square mile. There were too few deer for the property. So I built the herd and that was safe to do so because I had the habitat to support it, but I had to change the conditions of how the land was pressured, how much food was on the parcel, and what kind of habitat was there. On any parcel, you can attract more does if you work on it hard enough, even with extreme hunting pressure on your edges, because you just create those conditions, those does and fawns move very little during the day. If you have quality food during October, November, they might move 100 yards during the daylight. After dark, they go wherever they want to go, but you're just controlling that daylight movement because there's no one hunting them at night legally in most areas. So, so consume habitat, that's a very bad thing. And again, you create that melting pot or, or vacuum where they just keep coming, keep coming. Does, fawns come from everywhere. When you have great habitat and food, and again, they just take up that space. Find hunters. This is what's tough too. You know, there's been studies done where the average age of doe, the higher it gets, the older they get, then the more wary they are of hunters. They're used to you always sitting in that stand location or that blind or accessing the food plot during daylight. Hard to get on and off the property without spooking deer because of access issues. So it's not a good thing. A lot more eyes, a lot more noses, a lot more ears. Really hard for you to get on and off the property when it's overrun by does and that's a bad thing. You know, I go to properties all the time that there's lots of does. We can see them just driving around in the side by side on the land. They stand and watch you but those rare mature bucks that they see and have on the land for a few days here and there during the fall, especially during the rut, aren't there the rest of the season. They're just coming through for the rut here and there, but they're coming from home. The land isn't the home, they're coming somewhere else is their home, and that's where they spend the most amount of weeks and time. And so they're only on your property for a little bit, and it becomes a lot harder to consistently shoot the best bucks in the area, and you're certainly not controlling the herd. Because wherever those mature bucks live and call home during the fall, those are the people, and those are the hunters and landowners that get to control the herd, because the hardest portion of the herd to actually grow and control or hunt are mature bucks. In a lot of lands, you can go out almost every day and find a doe to shoot, even on public land that I know of. But trying to do that with a mature buck, saying, well, I'm just going to go shoot a mature buck every time I sit. That's... That's what's really, really, really tough. It's not, uh, not easy to do, and it's hard to do that. Um, even, you know, if I say we shoot a mature buck, or I do every five, six sets I go out, or seven sets, whatever it is, there's a lot of preparation and timing that goes into that, so I make sure I'm hunting the best times to get on that property. So a lot of eyes, a lot of ears, a lot of noses makes it very difficult. And then they destroy fall food. If you have does on your property a lot during the fall, it's because they were there during the summer. It's hard to have a lot of does in the fall without great does in the summer. Now, if you have really good fall food, fall cover, and you don't have summer food, then you might not have those does and fawns. We'll talk about that in a little bit. So they're not waiting like an army if they're there during the summer to destroy your food plots as soon as they come up. And that's what I see happen a lot too. So let's say you have a lot of does and fawns there during the summer, you plant your August food sources, September, late July, whatever that timing is for you and what you're planting. And then that army of does and fawns is waiting for those tender young shoots of green to come up and they just hammer it. Where if you have a lag time in there where does and fawns are somewhere else during the summer, then you have that four weeks, five weeks, six weeks of lag time 
where you can actually grow appreciable plots that get good volume on, and then the does and fawns come in. So now your plots have been able to establish the does and fawns are coming in. And even that alone is a good reason not to have a lot of summer deer on your property, but it can really destroy your fall food and limit your fall food. One of the best ways to increase the amount of fall food you have is to make sure the does and fawns aren't there like an army waiting for them to come out come up and we'll talk about what to do about that. They can ruin the rut. You know, if you have a lot of does and fawns, that buck finds a doe to breed, he doesn't need to move very far to find that next doe to breed. And that's pretty standard in a lot of areas. But if you have a little bit more balanced herd, and you'll see this a lot on public land, you know, public land a lot of times have more balance in the herds than, uh, than private land. Because private land owners put all the, their time and efforts and resources into cover and food. They attract a lot of deer and then if those deer are there during the summer, they're in the form of does and fawns, they stay, and then they hunt poorly, spook the deer off, they come back on, mature bucks can't take that type of stress, either from hunter stress or herd stress, they're not just not there. Public land, a lot of times you can go back deep enough where you find a better herd balance and herd structure make up so that bucks will actually move a long ways on public land to find another doe because there's so few deer, you don't have those concentrations of pockets of big doe herds, and so they have to move to find them where on private land. There's concentrations of does. They literally don't have to go far to find a next doe to breed. And that makes the rut very difficult for you to navigate and not as much fun. And you'd think it'd be the flip side. You have a bunch of does, but because those does are there, because likely if there's a lot of does there, the mature bucks look at it as a nocturnal partial. That means there's not a lot of mature bucks that actually view your parcel as favorable even during the rut. They'd rather be somewhere else where they've gotten used to and accustomed to a lot lower level of stress. They don't want to travel because again, they're coming from home. They're not, your, your land's not home just because they show up there at night. Wherever they're at during the daylight is where home's at. So you can have a very poor rut, even though you have a lot of does because you're gonna limit the number of mature bucks and come on your land anyways. Again, they're not coming from home. They're just visiting. So they're not there for that long. You don't get to see them for that long. Maybe they come on late season food if you have a whole bunch left over, but if you have a ton of does, a lot of times you don't have a lot of food left over going into December. So bottom line is it can really destroy your rut by having too many does. So what to look for? One of the ratios I like to see is, think about, really doesn't matter how many deer you have in August. You know, like if you have no deer, that doesn't mean you don't have a good property. If you have a lot of deer, it typically means you have a bad property. But even then, that doesn't mean you have a bad fall or a bad herd. So what I like looking at is how many deer do you have on your land in October, November? And just looking at your food sources, how many does and fawns do you have? Do you think you just add them up on your food sources everywhere? Meaning that you have 20 does and fawns on a 40 acre parcel. Just looking at general numbers, you're probably about 10 too many. On 200 acres, if you have 40 does and fawns, on that property, you probably have 20 too many, uh, 15 too many, whatever that number is. And that's based on a host of factors, depending on how much food you have, how much habitat you have, what type of cover you are, what region you're in. So it's really subjective on that overall number. What's not subjective, what I see on a lot of quality parcels, is that the number of does and fawns should equal the number of total antler bucks you see over the course of the entire season on your cameras and in person. So if you have 15, I go to a property and it's 100 acres. And they're telling me, yeah, we probably have 60 does and fawns. Well, I can guess they're probably only seeing 15, 20 different bucks. Maybe they're seeing 25 different bucks. But bottom line is the ratio is way off. I want to see one to one, meaning one doe and fawn for every antlered buck. And on good parcels, what we often see in Wisconsin, Minnesota, is you'll see more of a factor of two to one, two bucks. Now those bucks are not living there. This is not a sex ratio. It's just a ratio of number of bucks versus does and fawns. So what I'll see is, see property of 15, 18 does and fawns, and then you'll see 35 different antler bucks, or you'll see a property that has 45 antler bucks throughout the entire season. Some of these bucks might be there for a week, two weeks, some a few days. Some that are there for a few months off and on. But bottom line is, you're seeing more ratio of 15, 20 does and fawns, 45 bucks, or 20, 25 does and fawns and 45 bucks. That's where you start seeing good ratios. So really you can know if things are out of whack when you say, wow, I haven't, it's, again, it's not a sex ratio because always look at it like if you're seeing 10 does to every buck, that's because someone else has a pile of bucks. That ratio is never 10 to one because there's always button bucks coming into the herd. There's always buck fawns that are born. The ratio, I believe scientifically and biologically going into the hunting season can never be worse than about 3.2 to one, 3.2 does to every one buck. So if you're not seeing a lot of bucks versus the number of does you have on your property, 
it's because they're somewhere else. And think about that. Why are they not on your land? You know, it'll give you some really good clues. But look for that ratio of at least one doe and fawn to every antler buck. Every antler buck, meaning what you accumulate for the entire year, spikes, little bucks, whatever it might be, but something with antlers, meaning they're a year and a half old and older, and then count up those does and fawns. Look at that ratio. We talk about that a lot with clients in that first uh, hour, hour and a half on their property just to get an overall feel for what's going on because if they say well we have 30 does and fawns 25 regardless of the property size but we're seeing 25 to 30 does and fawns and we're seeing yeah about 15 antler bucks we know that there's probably a doe herd problem during the summer what i call a doe factory problem because there's too many does and fawns there's probably a lot of hunting pressure being applied during the season so the mature bucks recognize this parcel is not someplace they want to be during daylight so only if they're looking for a doe will they be there which isn't very often but we start seeing some problems and so it starts leading us down some questions well where are your where are your blinds and stands on your food plots what are you planting do you have summer food you start to see the same problems over and over and over and over again and uh, it's really enlightening as to what an overabundance not that does in general but an overabundance of does can do on your land and how bad it is so look for that ratio what to do about it of course is trigger control i like early season shooting does if you need to in late season but the closer you get to that november time period at november so november on a timeline right here beginning of the season to the end of the season i like to see you shoot does here but as it gets close to to that mid-november rut time gun season time from many states you shoot fewer does and then when it gets to the later season you shoot more so then when you're during the rut and you're at the highest hunting pressure times you're not shooting does on your land and they just run off to someone else's land box and get shot and you have less control of the herd if you're just trying to shoot does all through the year i like that late season time if we haven't shot anything early because you're setting them up you haven't overpressured your food plots, haven't overpressured your land. The does do the same things every single day where mature bucks do not, and they become easy pickings to go out there if you need to lower some numbers. But before you even do any of that with trigger control, look at how much habitat you have during the summertime. Does want high stem count cover to hide their fawns in. The best fawning cover has the most stems per acre, whether that's grasses, briars, weeds, hardwood regeneration, shrubs. That's where they need to hide, hide those fawns. So if you have that type of cover, what kind of cover is that? That's the best kind of cover that you want for the fall to attract your deer in general because deer need that high stem count, good regen, thick cover, especially as you get in, go from October to November, November to December, let alone all the way through January, February, March. So that's critical. And then if you add summer food in high value, high acres, out here we'll have about 17 total acres this year. We're going to expand about an acre and a half. And we'll have about an acre, acre and a quarter of clover because those are small hunting plots but our big plots won't have any summer green on it that deer can actually access i want to spread those does and fawns around the neighborhood i want them to be them to be on my property or my neighbor's properties that have lots of beans on them where they're over hitting their beans their food plots all summer long we'll have beans on our property again this year in our properties overall we had some beans on our property in wisconsin last year but we fence them we don't want deer hitting those beans all summer long because it magnifies the number of does and fawns are there because they love those summer beans, love, love summer alfalfa, love summer of clover. So if you have, like if we had eight acres of clover, that's what I used in the UP of Michigan. I had eight and a half acres of plots, 14 different plots. I had all eight and a half acres growing in clover during the summertime. And then I'd convert about two thirds of that into fall annual, cool season annual of different varieties with a clover base. Then the clover would come back for the following year. That was when I was in herd building mode. When I built it to the numbers I thought were safe, safe, then I cut the clover out. But bottom line is if you have great fall and winter cover and you add great fall food and you throw in just a little bit too much hunting pressure, you're gonna have, you're gonna be overrun by does. And, the, and, and your property gets a stigma of not being a daylight parcel when it comes to mature bucks. So trigger control is one thing, but before you even do that, look at how many does and fawns you have in your property. Now, if you're surrounded by ag land, big bean fields, people say, well, there's not much I can do about it. And that's true because sometimes there'll be a big bean field here and your cover is what they have for summertime. So pretty easy for them just to flip around and hit your food plots in the fall. And there's not a lot you can do about it. But a lot of other property like here, we're surrounded in alfalfa all over the place. Um, single farmer farms on two sides of us, hundreds of acres. And so the deer can go out anywhere. They can be on the neighbor's property, our property. And for that, if my neighbor has some summer food source, 
he might shoot a buck like Chad did last year. He shot a giant uh, middle of September. We were hoping to, we, we had pictures of him a lot of video, October, November, December, the previous years. But he was still on that summer bean kick over there and uh, we lost that buck. But bottom line is, is there's a good trade-off. You know, I'd rather have a balanced herd than focus on that one buck, even though it was a doozy. But bottom line is, I want those does and fawns spread out everywhere. Invite them back during the fall. Then you lose some of those does and fawns to your neighbors. They get to actually harvest for doe population, removal, deer removal, work on the population. You end up having fewer deer overall on your property, but you find that balance a lot more achievable when it comes to that number of overall antler bucks throughout a season compared to your average doe and fawn number in October, November. So that's the, those are those steps. You know, really good steps. You always want to work on your property for great fall food, great fall cover. But that doesn't mean you want deer there all year long. You know, some people have thousands of acres. They can work on summer and fall. But even then, I really want to limit the number of summer food because then it gets into a situation where you just don't have enough friends and tags and tag numbers by yourself time to actually lower the number of does. I've gone to properties, they've shot 30, 40, 50 does in one season. And that's because they have that summer food and they've had to make some drastic changes to reduce the number of does so they can have more bucks and have more balanced herd and be the actual herd influencer in the neighborhood because the property that has a pile of does on it is not the property that influences the deer herd in a positive way throughout the deer season, typically a negative way. Be that one that has more balance. Hey, this is coming from even summer food. This is coming from, we have summer food. We have our summer plow down. We have clover that we sell. And... I don't want you to have extreme amounts of summer food because it, it can create a big problem when it comes to does. So that's why you don't see me pushing a lot of summer food. Again, we'll have some great clover plots, little hunting plots or pass-through plots, but those don't drive a deer herd during the summertime. Those are just a percentage of the food in the fall and meant to be more of a hunting plot on the way to something bigger and better that's more completely 100% fall slanted. That's why does can be a problem with too many numbers. Take up space. They ruin your resources of habitat. They ruin the rut. There's a lot of reasons to look for balance in the herd. I'm not saying no does, because then how attractive is your land if you can't even attract a doe? They're the easiest to attract. But you want balance, and these are some thoughts on that and some strategies that have worked for decades for me and work for our clients too all across the country. There's no state that this is specific for. It's more of a concept that works anywhere. I'll wait till Rome's, and it'll be good for you. Work on that balance this summer, off season. It only takes one growing season, meaning this summer, to turn this around. And I hope you can do so and experience a great herd with not too many does going into the hunting season. Now, I don't know if you've checked out our main website lately, whitetailhabitatsolutions.com, but we've really had a lot going on, including hats, books, our web class, and certainly our new seed company, WHS Wildlife Blends. When you click on seed on our site, it'll take you right to our brand new site for the seed company. We have all 12 blends available. So check it all out though. I encourage you, I appreciate you checking it out. Whether you buy anything or not, really appreciate you visiting the site and uh, seeing what's going on and continue to watch because we have big things coming later this year.